dawn and the hidden leaf was always a sight to behold. Kerr and I was sitting on the roof of her apartment complex with her knees buried into her chest. She was thinking over what happened last night and the story that Senzuru had told her. She really wanted to hate him, but she was now confused more than any other time in her life. She loves Asma, that much she knows. However, her love for Senzuru never faded. Flashback. Senzuru took a step closer towards her. That battle, I didn't expect to survive. The technique didn't go through properly, because I was also trying to take out Shikaku's sensei opponent as well. My guess as to what happened is that I was blown hundreds of yards away for not executing it correctly. The next thing I remember is waking up in a hut and being tended to by an old man. I was informed that I was out for weeks. He was surprised that I even survived. I was too. He told me that when he came upon my body that my breathing was shallow, but the tattoo on my left arm was glowing orange. I didn't know why until I had enough strength to summon a phoenix, which wasn't for about two weeks. He healed me and I had intended to come home. But he knew what my tattoo represented, and he made me an offer. Kerr and I looked at him with a questioning look. What was that offer? He said that if I wanted to get stronger, he would take me to a man he knew to help train. At first, I was about to say no, but then I thought about Mother, Shizune, Asuma, Sensei, and you. So I decided to take him up on his offer. A means to an end, eh? Senju laughed to try and lighten the mood. It didn't work. Her and I narrowed her eyes. He quickly spoke in hopes of not making her mad. Well, moving along, he took me to his friend, Gogyo Taizen, who was skilled in Taijutsu and Kenjutsu. In fact, his sword style, my style, Divine Wrath, is the brother style of the Heavenly Sword. Similar principles, but different in many ways. So, what happened while training with this Gogyo guy? Kern I asked, seemingly interested. I trained under him until I was about 22. It took me up until I was about 20 to master his sword style, and his fighting style about another two years. It wasn't hard since Taijutsu was always one of my strong points, plus training with my mother since I could walk helped too. He informed the woman he cared deeply for. Why didn't you come back after your training? What is your reason for that? She asked him with a hint of anger in her voice. Not really a reason, just something I had to do. What was so important that you couldn't let your family and your friends know you were alive? She asked. Senju looked down at the ground as if he was angry with it while clenching his fist. My vow, my vow to uphold my master's dying words. After my training was complete, I was going to return to the village. I went to a town about two days away from my master's location to stock up on goods for the trip back to Konoha. When I got back, he was cut up and bleeding. He told me while he was dying that a cloud ninja named Aisu with the legendary dragon fang had attacked him using the wicked wind style. My master then told me his reason for training me. He told me that his friend saw the tattoo on my arm and knew that I had the phoenix contract. It was his duty as the user of the divine wrath to protect the map and keep the location of the map hidden. It was also the duty to protect the location of the dragon slayer, but that was lost in the destruction of his people about 20 years prior. He told me of the legendary Phoenix Claw, which was my first time hearing about it. So what did you do next? Kern I asked. He told me that he had a map with the location to the Phoenix Nest. He told me where it was and that I should burn it when I get it. He also told me that I needed to return to the nest. And after that, seek out Ryuho Minashu. I knew going to the nest was for the purpose of getting the sword. I didn't know what the other part was for. With his last words, he told me that I had to get stronger because the look in that cloud ninja's eyes showed nothing but evil and destruction. He then died in my arms. Senju said the last part in a low tone. Kerr and I couldn't respond. Losing someone close to you was always painful, she knew that. However, she had to press on to find out more. I'm sorry about your sensei, but could you tell me what did you do for the next 12 years? Well, I did what my sensei said and went back to the cave known as the Phoenix Nest. This time, I summoned the boss of the Phoenix, Xenos. 
He presented me with the sword. He told me it would be a while, as in years, to learn how to use a sword to its full capacity, and that I should train within the lair to learn how. I didn't have time for years. My objective was to fulfill my sensei's dying wish. I left after two months of training. I thought that was all the time I needed to master the sword. I was wrong, but I wouldn't learn that lesson until two years later. I traveled around for about a year and a half, honing my skills. Then I did what my sensei said. I sought out Ryuho. When I went to see country, I found out that he had just left for the wind country on clan business. I decided to track him down, he told Kur and I. Did you meet him in wind country? Yes, I confronted him and told him the story of what happened to my sensei, and that my sensei ordered me to seek him out. I asked why. He told me the history of both clans, their purpose and of the Taizen clan and the Minashu clan's duty to the world. The Taizen clan was to protect the locations of the mythical contracts. The Minashu clan was entrusted with the Heaven Blade. Unlike Heaven's Blade in the Phoenix Summon, the Dragon Summon didn't select its wielder based on their good hearted nature. The Dragon Contract selected the person based on their power to wield it alone which is why it needed to be protected from falling into the wrong hands. He told me he knew when my sensei asked him to seek me out. He told me it was to see if I was ready to go up against a user of the Wicked Wind, who took out my master. So, you had to fight him? Kur and I questioned Senzuru. Senzuru answered, Yes, the battle was very intense. I didn't realize how strong I had become in that nine year span away from Konoha. The battle was intense, but in the end, we drew even. He told me that I was good enough to take on the user of that style, and left me in the field. I always wanted to finish that fight, but we never did. The next thing that needed to be done was to confront Aisu, but I couldn't just walk in the cloud and confront one of their own. Did you ever find the ninja? He smiled. It is funny how fate works out. I was actually in bird country. I was trying to formulate a plan on how I could locate this ninja. My next stop was rain country, but I would never get there. I was ambushed by a couple of clown ninjas who mistook me for a missing ninja. They attacked me, but I dispatched them rather quickly. However, I was then confronted by the face that I used my angel of death technique on. Kur and I was shocked beyond belief. He survived, but how? I told you that I didn't execute it correctly, because I focused on taking out Shikaku Sensei's enemy as well. Anyway, that's not the shocking part. The shocking part is that he pulled out the blade that my Sensei described. I told you how it's funny fate works out. Senzuru informed her. Did you fulfill your Sensei's dying wish? Kur and I wanted to know if he killed the ninja that she last saw him fight. No, in fact, he is very much alive. But our last battle put him on the edge. He had more experience using his sword than I did, but I was skilled enough to make him retreat. I realized that if I had stayed and held my skills with the sword like Zeno suggested, I would have won that battle. I knew it was pointless to pursue a ninja, so I decided to go and do what Zeno suggested to do in the first place. The next six years, I trained in the Phoenix Nest, learning all I needed to know about the sword as well as honing my skills with it. So you finished training two years ago? What did you do during the past two years, Kern I asked. He gave his response. Observing events unfold. You remember a year ago when Naruto slaughtered all those ninjas in the land of earth and rain? She nodded, causing him to continue. The cloud was behind the whole thing. After they informed their alliances with the rain and rock, the Raikage suggested that they could strengthen their nations. By learning the technique of the Minashu clan, he suggested that they kidnap the daughter of the clan head. So that's why Naruto killed all those ninjas, Kurnai said to himself, finally understanding his actions. Yes, but the goal was to strengthen the rock and the rain, so they could attack the leaf alongside the cloud. Naruto spoiled their plans by bringing her back home safely, Sender informed her. But the cloud still declared war on us, Kurnai informed him. Yes, and they would have regardless. Aisu, the fifth Raikage, is interested in controlling all of the nations. The reason he attacked Konoha was because of the potential threat it posed and to draw me out. 
I was trying to catch him, but he decided to catch me. I'm sure Kasan informed all Jonians and Junians yesterday of what will happen and the exams coming in six months. Kerr and I nodded. Yes, she believes that it'll be the sand and sound invasion all over again. I figured out his actions, so I decided it was time to return home. He walked up to her and stroked her cheek. It was time to come back and protect everything that I love. Kerr and I backed away. You can't just come back and expect us to pick up where we left off. I know. He looked up to the star-decorated sky. Do you remember the night we spent under the Sakura tree in the woods? Kerr and I wondered where he was going with this. How could he question her like that? It was the night she lost her virginity to the man she vowed to always love. The night was one of the fondest memories of her life. She remembers the two of them lying under the petals, looking at the starlight sky. He looked at her. I was just thinking about what you said. Kerr and I remember the night and everything about it like it was yesterday. But she decided to play dumb. What did I say? He looked back at the sky and gazed upon the moon with a sad look. I broke two promises. One that I made to myself. And the one that I made to you. When we were little, I knew you were special. Even though you treated me like I was a nuisance. I was glad when we got put on the same team. It was like a dream come true for me. When your father died on a mission a year into us being on the same squad, I remember the sadness and how you would cry every time you were alone. You were in pain, and I promised myself I would protect you from experiencing pain like that again. The night we spent under the tree, you asked me to promise that I would never leave you, and I promised I wouldn't. That night was the first time that I told you that I loved you, and I would always be there for you. Kerr and I was in tears. Why? Why are you doing this? He looked back at her and smiled. Because uh, I love you. He placed his hand under her chin and elevated her head. Looking into her teary eyes, he inched closer to her. Kerr and I closed her eyes and did the same. When they got an inch away from each other's lips, Kerr and I broke free from the hand that held her chin. I can't do this. A lot has changed while you were gone, you know. I'm dating Osama now, I can't, we can't, things aren't what they used to be. Sanjuru felt like a knife had gone into his heart when he heard Osama's name, but how could he really get mad? No, he couldn't, and he knew Kerr and I was right, but his heart didn't care about what was right, it just wanted Kerr and I. Kerr and I decided she needed to get away. I have things to do in the morning, I have to go. She turned around and started to walk away. Do you still love me? Zendru yelled out, freezing her in her tracks. How could she not say yes? Deep in her heart, she still loved him. However, she loved Osma too. With her back to him, she spoke. Yes, I never stopped. But I also love Osma. Kerr and I walked away, leaving one of the men that she loved. And a flashback. Kerr and I brought her knees further into her chest as she recapped last night's events. She loved them both, but which one did she love more? Kerr and I sat on the roof trying to figure out the answer to a question that she couldn't find an answer to. Waterfall country. Neji had his squad up at least two hours before the sun had risen. He wanted to arrive in Waterfall before noon. Although they were in water country, there was a chance that ninjas from Rock was still in the country. Shinobi from the Rock had been patrolling the area. Neji glanced at Kiba, who was next to Akamaru. Kiba. Have you heard any word on Hinata? Kiba shook his head. No, she still isn't allowed any visitors. I tried to go see her yesterday before I went to the Hokage's office, but Lady Sonata's order is still in effect. Ino overheard their conversation and decided to add her two cents. I wonder if she's okay. Joji turned to Sakura. Sakura, don't you have any idea on Hinata's status? No, Sonata is tending to her case personally. It's unlike Sensei to do something of this nature, but I trust her judgment. Sakura said with the utmost confidence in her Sensei's decision. Ino asked Sakura a question that had been bugging her, since Sakura and everyone came back from the mist. Sakura, how come I didn't see Naruto with you guys yesterday? Neji decided to answer. Naruto had other business to take care of. We haven't seen him since we parted ways in the mist. He said something about going to sea country. Kipa wanted to know how the meeting in mist went. Sakura and Neji, would you guys give me the details about what happened in the mist? Nothing, except that Naruto was attacked by ninjas from Kumo. 
I don't know what the cloud has against them, but they attacked him nonetheless, Eji informed Ino, Kiba, and Choji. Ino, who was walking next to her best friend and roommate, gave her a slight nudge on the arm to get her attention. Hey Sakura, between us girls, what do you think of Lady Tsunade's son? Well, as far as looks go, he is attractive. I only met him briefly yesterday before we left, so I don't know. I'm not sure what type of personality he has. Personality is important. You know, looks aren't everything. Sakura gave her assessment. Kiba, who was walking ahead of them, sort of, and then whispered to Choji, who overheard it as well. I guess Sasuke is Mr. Personality, eh, Choji? Look at me. I'm Sasuke Uchiha. Now bow down to my greatness. That's really the personality. Choji snickered at Kiba's comment. Sakura and Ino heard the two guys laugh. Ino was curious at what they were laughing at. What's so funny, guys? Nothing, you know, it's just an inside joke, Choji informed his friend. Neji was scouting the area for enemy ninjas or waterfall ninjas that could provide safe passage to the hidden waterfall village. But his mind was all over the place. It kept going back to Inata, the upcoming war, the cloud ninja, among other things. You know, saw the look on Neji's face. To anyone else, his expression would seem like its typical look of indifference. But not to Ino. You know. Being on quite a few missions with him in Anbu, she knew. He was concerned about something. Neji being concerned was never a good thing. Neji, what's the matter? I can tell by the look that you are worried about something. Neji looked at Ino. This whole upcoming war, but most of all, I'm concerned about the clown ninja who has made Sasuke and Naruto targets. Why, those two can take care of themselves, Ino said, trying to ease his worry. Neji spoke once more. I'm well aware of that, but to try and repeat what Orochimaru did, knowing we would be prepared and having a geographical advantage is a bit odd, don't you think? Also, if Naruto or Sasuke were to get killed before the war, then we would be losing two valuable shinobi. Although those two are highly skilled, they're not immortal. Neji is right, Ino, but I think Snare has it covered, Neji. Besides, are you suggesting that we keep tabs on those two and keep them in the village away from missions? You know well as I do that they would never go for it. Their pride wouldn't allow it. The best we can do is to be prepared for what's to come. It was now close to noon, and Neji's squad was approaching the area near the waterfall on the map. During this time, they were discussing stuff in their personal life and previous missions. Well, Sakura, Ino, Choji, and Kiba anyway, Neji on the other hand, remained silent, making sure that nothing escaped his Byakugan. Sakura, Ino, Kiba, and Choji were all talking when Neji stopped. According to the map, this is the waterfall. Sakura looked at the waterfall that Neji had pointed out. Looks like we have arrived. That cave over there is the entrance. We're going to have to swim through the tunnels in that cave to get the villa. Sakura and everyone else jumped out of the way to avoid the kunai and shuriken that came at them. Neji searched for the ninjas, who had attacked. The group was surrounded by approximately 20 ninjas from the hidden waterfall. A tall man with long brown hair saw the headbands of the approaching shinobi. Stand down, they're not our enemies. He appeared in front of Neji via Shunchi no Jutsu. State your purpose, or else I cannot permit you to go any further. Regardless of your allies, you do understand the protocols that we must abide by to protect our village. I understand completely. Our reason for coming today is by your special request of the Hokage. The letter that I have here is for your village leader. The Hokage has ordered that I put this letter in his hand personally, so if you will allow us permission to enter, we will complete our mission and be on our way. Niji informed the waterfall shinobi of his mission. The shinobi motioned for two of his men to come next to him. They appeared next to him and awaited his orders. Make sure that our guests have safe passage to the village. He turned his attention back to Neji. My men will escort you to Lord Shibuki. Neji and company followed their two escorts. All they had to do was inform the leader of the hidden waterfall, and they would be on their way home. As far as Neji was concerned, the mission was by far one of the easiest missions he had in a while, but he was still on guard. Even though this village was allied with the leaf, you never knew what could happen. He just hopes that things would go smoothly for once. Sea Country It was a beautiful afternoon in Sea Country. The sun was shining bright over the land. Hayami stretched and yawned as she sat up in her bed. 
The girl was worried about Naruto and didn't get to sleep until very late. Instantly realizing that it was the next day, she jumped out of the bed. And with her pajamas still on, she ran straight to Naruto's room. The girl got to his door and opened it slowly. Her eyes widened in shock as she looked at the bed. Naruto was gone. Below the compound, Ryuho and Naruto were standing in front of the three doors which contained the trials. Ryuho went to check up on Naruto in the middle of the night. Naruto was taking out the bandages on his body when Ryuho walked in on him. He informed him that he was ready to take the next test. Ryuho didn't argue with Naruto. He then told him that the next trial would begin at noon. Naruto was now standing next to his sensei. In front of the door on the far right was the word FAITH written on it. Ryuho placed a hand on Naruto's shoulder. Are you ready? Naruto turned his head slightly. Yes, let's get this test done with. Ryuho opened the door, gesturing with his hands for Naruto to go before him. Naruto walked past his sensei into a room that was nothing like the last one. This room was just a very large dojo with lanterns providing a minute amount of light. The lighting reminded him of the lighting in the cave beyond the entrance. Ryuho got Naruto's attention when he opened his mouth to speak. This test is a one-on-one -on -one battle between you and me. Fight me with everything you have, Naruto. You might want to release your gravity seals now. The head of the Minashu clan pulled the Heaven's Blade from its sheath. He then got into his stance. Naruto complied and did what his sensei suggested. He could feel the difference, but he knew it wouldn't help him. Not in his current condition, even if he was healed. Ryuho was still the superior fighter among the two. Also, add Ryuho's legendary sword to the mix. Naruto wasn't sure if he could win. He would definitely fight regardless of the situation. He just wasn't sure if he could win. Naruto grabbed the blade that was on his back. He removed it from the sheath and slipped into a fighting stance as well. Come at me, Naruto. Show me how far you have come in three years. Ryuho said, eh, hoping to get a student to attack. It worked to perfection. Naruto came at Ryuho. Naruto brought back a sword and swung it with as much force as he could muster. Ryuho blocked it with a sword with little effort. Naruto swung again, but this time Ryuho blurred out of sight, appearing behind the vessel of the QB. He went to strike, but Naruto blocked the blow. Naruto blurred out of his sight, and was now kicking off the ceiling in the dojo. By doing this, he was accelerating towards Ryuho with the intent to pierce him. Ryuho jumped towards Naruto and slashed at his chest. The brightness of the sword shined so brightly at that moment that it couldn't be determined who was injured until both warriors landed a few yards away with their backs facing towards one another. It was apparent who was in the short end. Naruto fell to the ground with a gash across his stomach. Blood was all over his blue shirt. Riho turned around to address Naruto. Is this all you have? Please tell me that my training you was not a waste of time. You do realize you can't beat me with simple attacks such as that. You can't beat me as you are now. You are not strong enough. Since quitting is against your nindo, what will you do, Naruto? Naruto turned around to face his sensei with a smirk on his face. You asked that question, already knowing what I'm going to say. This is far from over, Sensei. I'm coming at you with everything I have. Riho smiled at his students' will to continue. Naruto, on the other hand, was talking to the fox in the back of his mind. You are weak, boy. You do not have the strength to fight this man. Allow me to lend you my power. Together, we can crush this fool. The fox tried his best to convince Naruto that using his chakra was the only way to win. No, I can do this by myself. I don't need your power, Naruto said, hoping his tenant would stop pestering him. Just like you didn't need my power to get you out of that Uchiha boy's genjutsu. Face it, Naruto. You need my power. You may have gotten stronger, but you need my power to win this battle. And you know it. Stop procrastinating and draw on my chakra. Elevating his voice to say that last part, he knew, and it was working because the boy had no response. Naruto knew that QB was right. He couldn't win this battle without drawing on his chakra. Naruto didn't want to use the fox's power, but he couldn't win without it. Facing off with someone of Ryuho's caliber was just impossible to do, especially when you're weak and not completely healed. Naruto made a decision to wait and see how things went before using the QB's power. Right now, he wanted to do it for himself in Konoha. Though Kagi was walking the streets of the village, she actually had enough time to take a break from her paperwork. She decided to go to a local restaurant that served some dango and sake. 
On her way there, she saw her son walking in the opposite direction. Senjiro had no particular direction he was going in. He was just going over what Kurenai had told him. She was with Osma now. He really wanted to be with her. But he always wanted her to be happy. His thoughts were broke by a familiar voice. Deep in thought, I see. He looked up to see that his mother was standing directly in front of him. Kasan, what are you doing outside of the office? I thought you had a lot of work to do. I completed most of it, so decided to get something to eat. Come with me, I could use a company. Send her nothing important to do, so he followed the Hokage. About five minutes later, they were in the restaurant talking and eating. He banged his head against the table. Kasan, Mom, what am I supposed to do? I don't know. Do you still care for her deeply? Snotty asked. Yes, but she's happy now, and I don't want to come between that. But at the same time, he paused and looked away from his mother. Stoney finished his thought. At the same time, you want to be with her. Yes, yes I do. I'm torn on what course of action I should take. Stoney analyzed the situation for a moment before offering her advice. If you really care for her, then you'll let her make the decision. You told me that she still loves you. However, she also said that she is in love with Ozma now as well. I think that you should just let her decide what she wants. Sendrew knew what his mother said was true. He decided to change the subject because it was too painful to deal with at the moment. So, can you tell me about the Genin candidates? Well, according to Aruka, who knew some outstanding candidates, there is a Hyuga from the branch house who is pretty good, according to Aruka. He also mentioned a girl who is strong in Taijutsu, and a boy who is of no prestigious background of any kind but is well-rounded, and his ninjutsu is slightly above that of a genin. Other than that three that I've mentioned, everyone else is average at best. It's not I gave him the answer to the question he asked. That doesn't bode well for Konoha, now does it, Mom? She let out a sigh. I know, but I didn't expect this batch to be the next rookie nine. That would be a tough act to follow. His eyebrow elevated slightly. Rookie nine? What do you mean by that? Six years ago, nine rookies straight out of the academy were selected by their Jonin instructors to take the Genin exams. All of them advanced to the second round, and four advanced to the finals. After hearing what his mother had told him, he was now curious as to who were the Jonin instructors responsible for preparing their Genins for the Chunin exams. Who were the Jonin instructors responsible for this? Snally smiled, knowing that he would be surprised at the mentioning the two Jonins who was on his team. Kakashi, Asuma, and Kurnai. Really? That is an amazing feat. Truly. Do I know any of the rookies that were trained by Kakashi, Asuma, and Kurnai? Sensor asked, not knowing that he knew who five of them were. I believe you met Naruto and Sasuke and Mist. Uh, Shino was the young Jonin with the sunglasses and hood on at your Jonin ceremony. You also met Sakura and Eno yesterday. They're members of the Rookie Nine. Sensor slapped his forehead at the mention of Eno. And girl, she flirted with me the whole time you introduced me to Sakura. I wondered if she's more concerned with boys than being a ninja. So then I chuckled uh, at Senju's comment. I think she has a slight crush, but don't let that fool you. He knows an Anbu, along with most of the rookie nine. So that should speak the volume of her skills. The only members that you haven't met yet are Shikamaru Nara, Kiba Inazuka, Joji Akamichi, and Hinata Hyuga. Everyone from the Rookie Nine are Jonin, except for her and Naruto. The latter didn't make Jonin for obvious reasons, and I think it affected uh, the Hyuga girl. How so? She had a crush on the boy. When he was banished, she closed herself off. I think if she didn't feel obligated to her family, she would have led with him. She became a Junin at 14, and she only took the Jonin exams once. I would get into it more, but let's just say being the daughter of Hiyashi Hyuga is not the best thing in the world for her, so I said, hoping her son would understand without her saying too much. Hiyashi always seemed like a nice guy when he was still with Yuri. On the way, how is Yuri? Does she still make great healing herbs? Senseru asked. Yuri died 12 years ago, so I said, in an almost sad town. Oh. I didn't know. Senju was surprised by the information as well, but he decided to change the subject. So, what about the Nara? How is he related to Shikaku-sensei? She knew the information would have pleased him to hear. He's Shikaku-sen. The two of them are nothing alike. I have to practically yell that lazy ass son of his just to get something done. 
However, he is one of the smartest shinobi with an IQ over 200. He's currently our lead strategist. Wow, it seems like most of them came from prestigious backgrounds. So, Mom, when do I get my first mission? Sensor asked with excitement in his voice. Sanai took a sip of her drink before responding. Come by the office tomorrow and I will assign you a mission. However, don't expect to go anywhere outside the borders of Konoha. Senju slumped his shoulders after hearing the news. So, I'm restricted to missions within Fire Country. Why didn't you just say that I can go outside but I can't leave the front yard? Sonata giggled at his childish antics. It reminded her of when she told him he couldn't play Ninja Tag because he didn't do his chores. Some things just never change. Six hours later, at Minashu Compound. The battle between Ryuho and Naruto waged on, but Naruto was on the losing end. He couldn't keep this up much longer, and he knew it. Ryuho was fast, stronger, and to top it off, he had a legendary sword. Naruto knew that the fox was right. God damn it, boy, why don't you just draw my power? You can't beat him without me. Look at yourself. You are heavily bruised and barely standing. Without me, you will lose. Come, Naruto. Let's show him what we can do with our power. Nakibi knew the boy was injured. The fact of the matter was that he hated his vessel losing because it would make him look weak. When Naruto was younger, the boy called on his chakra all the time, and it was usually because he needed it to win. When Naruto got older, he stopped calling on the fox altogether in battles. The boy only called on his power when he was training, getting his body used to its power. He remembered the last time the boy bit off more than he could chew. He was hoping the boy would call on his chakra so he could take over like he did when the boy trained with the Toad Hermit. The boy told him he would use the fox when he needed and that it wouldn't be likely because he would train himself more so he wouldn't have to. Nakibi laughed when the boy told him that. He knew the boy called him again. It was just only a matter of time and now was that time. He just had to push a little more, and Naruto would cave in. Naruto would never admit it, but he hated losing just as much as Sasuke. Ryuho studied his student. He was impressed that the boy went this long, considering that he wasn't fully healed when he told him that he was ready for the second trial. As impressive as he was, he knew Naruto was losing faith in his ability. If Naruto lost complete faith in himself and his abilities, then he would surely fail this trial. Riho smirked at Naruto, who was panting and glaring at him at the same time. What's the matter, Naruto? Getting weak? You want to call the fox power, eh? Go ahead. You as yourself are not strong enough to face me as you are. You're weak, Naruto. In the end, you will always have to rely on that crutch to bail you out. Makibi knew what the man was trying to do. He couldn't let this man succeed. It was his chance to take over the kid's body. Don't listen to him, Naruto. He knows that the two of us together could win. You do want to win, Naruto, don't you? Use your power so we can do that. Naruto was listening to the fox and his sensei. Naruto came to a decision. His sensei was right. The fox was always a crutch. He used that crutch against Sasuke at the Valley of the End. He used it against Neji in the Chunin exams. And he also used it against Sasuke in his last battle without anyone knowing. Although he didn't use the Kyuubi's chakra when he got older, he still always used it when he was in need or in a bind. No, Naruto said out loud to the fox. His sensei gave him a curious look. No, what is he talking about? The fox kept trying to persuade Naruto. Come Naruto, what happened to the kid who said please give me power or break this genjutsu? This is no time to act tough, you're going to lose. Naruto smirked while responding, he was breathing hard. I said no, I don't need you for this, I can do this by myself. You might as well shut up now because no matter what you say, I will not draw from your power. So, you might as well keep your ass quiet, furball. Why you little bass- Kibi was angry at Naruto's comment. I said shut your fucking mouth, you're breaking my concentration. Riho thought that Naruto was crazy, he seemed to be having a conversation with himself. Riho raised an eyebrow. You ready, or do you need some more time? Naruto placed both his hands on his sword and shifted into a fighting stance. I don't need any more time. Let's do this. 
blue chakra erupted from Naruto's body. The chakra surrounded its body. This lasted for about a couple seconds before it died down. So, he's using the last bit of his chakra to fight me. Riho thought as he prepared himself by slipping into a fighting stance as well. Naruto didn't waste any time jumping at Riho. Naruto brought his blade down, aiming for Sensei's head. Riho blocked the sword, but he noticed that the blow had more power in it than before. His attacks are getting stronger. He's starting to believe. Naruto continued his attack. The blonde shinobi appeared behind his master with the intention of slashing his back. Riho blurred out of Naruto's view before he could connect. Naruto looked up to see Ryuho coming at him with the sword raised above his head. Naruto jumped to his left to avoid the strike from the sword that was in Ryuho's right hand. The force that he used caused the sword to become stuck in the ground. Ryuho, being able to adapt, pushed off his sword with his right hand. He quickly spun around, while using the sword as a support for his left hand, landing a kick with his right foot into Naruto's face. As Naruto flew a couple of yards back, Ryuho removed the sword and charged at Naruto. Naruto used the palm of his free hand to touch the ground causing him to backflip back into his stance. Naruto had little time to react and not enough chakra to keep this up. He placed his remaining chakra into his sword and swung it at Ryuho. Ryuho placed chakra in his sword and swung it to counter Naruto's attack. There was an explosion of blue chakra throughout the dojo. The explosion was so bright that it was hard to see anything. When the dust and smoke cleared from the explosion, Ryuho was standing with the sword only an inch away from Naruto's eyes. He was smiling at a student, who had a shocked expression on his face and half of a sword in his hand. Ryuho held the glowing blade for a little longer before saying anything. It looks like you have passed this exam as well, Naruto. I must say that no one in our documented history has ever completed the first two trials in just two days. This is truly an unprecedented feat. He moved the blade that was inches away from Naruto's head and placed it back in its sheath. Let's go back to the compound and get you cleaned up and fed. You will only have four hours to prepare for the next test. We could go as soon as you wish, but I suggest you get some food in your system. You're going to need it. Naruto nodded. Food sounds really good. Naruto smirked before he passed out. Ryuho walked up to the boy. He saw that Naruto was smiling. This in turn made him smile as well. Must have passed out from chakra exhaustion. He should be up in an hour or so. You don't have to worry about fighting like the other trials. Well, not against an opponent such as myself. You come this far in two days, Naruto. Don't disappoint me now. Ryuho bent down and threw Naruto over his shoulder. An hour and a half later, Naruto was lying in the bed. Unlike yesterday, he didn't require most of his body to be bandaged. He had a few bandages on his body, his face and chest. The blonde Janobi heard muffled voices. He slowly opened his eyes to see that he was in his room with Ryuho, Kayori, Hayami, and Jiraiya. Naruto sat up. How long have I been out? Hayami jumped and embraced him into a hug. Big brother, you're awake. I'm so glad. Are you hurt anywhere, big brother? Do you need anything, big brother? Huh, big brother? Water? Food? Air, Naruto said in hope that the girl would soften her hug. She pulled back, releasing her hug after seeing that Naruto was turning blue in the face. Naruto took a deep breath and exhaled. Naruto rubbed the little girl's head. I'm kind of hungry. I'll get you some ramen right away. The girl jumped off the bed and ran to the kitchen to make some instant ramen for Naruto. Naruto turned to Riho. How long have I been out? An hour plus, don't worry. You have three hours before the final trial. Riho stated to Naruto. Naruto looked at Jiraiya. What are you doing here? Riho asked me to come here, but then he said that he didn't need me. I'm here now, because I decided to stick around. You look like shit, kid, Jiraiya said to the fourth legacy. I'll be fine, how's Yumi? I don't know, I haven't been in a leaf. I've been trying to finish my book and meeting up with some old friends. Anybody I know? Naruto asked. Naya and Hinata, Jirai answered. Being curious, what is Hinata doing with Naya? Jirai shrugged. I don't really know, but if I had to guess, I would say that Naya is training her. Oh. Hayami came back into the room with a tray of ramen. She handed Naruto the tray. He wasted no time discarding the contents in the bowl. Everyone looked disgusted by how Naruto was scoffing down the ramen. Hayami shook her head. Naruto, big brother, really needs to work on his manners. Kiori, still looking at Naruto in disgust, responded. 
You would think that being with us for a year would have rubbed off on the kid. Memories of his deceased friend came in his head. He smiled at the thought. Some things never change, eh, Jiraiya? Nope, I guess not. That boy reminds me of his father in so many ways that it's scary. Naruto heard everyone talking now while looking at him. When he lifted his head up with a mouthful of noodles, he saw everyone staring at him. What, something wrong? Kaori let out a sigh. Naruto, don't talk with food in your mouth. It makes it hard for people to understand you, and it's rude. Naruto slurped with the noodles. Sorry, I said, is there something wrong? Nothing's wrong, just looking at you, you're food, that's all. Putting that aside, Naruto, are you okay? Kaori asked, out of concern for Naruto's well-being. I'm fine, a little sore, but nothing too serious. Naruto put the tray on the side and got out of bed. He then turned his attention to Riho. If it's not too much to ask, I'm ready for the final trial. Riho closed his eyes to signify his disagreement. Naruto, use the three hours you have to recuperate. The next test isn't like the last two tests. I don't care, I want to get this over with already, Naruto said to his sensei. Riho looked into Naruto's eyes. He saw the unwavering determination in them. The boy would just keep bugging him until he caved. Alright, but change out of that rope and into some clothes. He know where to meet. Big Brother Naruto, you can't go. You're not even healed completely. You should wait until it's time to go, the girl pleaded, hoping he would see reason. Don't worry, I'll be fine. Now that I told you, there's nothing to worry about, Naruto said, hoping to reassure the girl. Riho laughed. Is that what you really think? This next trial will be anything but easy. I never had it easy. Hard has, in fact, always been my easy. Kiori observed the young man before her. Riho told her of his trials when he was younger. If it was like anything Riho told her, then Naruto was going to have his work cut out for him. She followed her husband out of the room. Jiraiya knew there was no convincing Naruto once his mind was made up. I'll be hanging back to Kona, Naruto. I guess I'll see you when you get back. Good luck. Save your luck for Granny Sinade. We both know she needs it more than anyone. I'll be fine. Jiraiya exited the room, leaving Naruto and Hayami. She smiled at Naruto. I won't worry about you, big brother. You said that you would be okay, so I believe you. She then exited the room. Naruto closed the door for privacy. He changed it into a black denim jacket with an orange t-shirt under it. The sweatpants and the sandals he had on matched the color of his jacket. Naruto was dressed and ready to take the final trial. Under the compound, 20 minutes later, Naruto was standing beside Riho in front of the door that had the word heart on it. Riho turned to Naruto. If you wish to back out and use the remaining time you have, now is the time. I'm not backing out, Naruto said with anger towards his sensei for even suggesting that. Very well. Riho opened the door and then entered the room. Naruto followed. The room wasn't what Naruto expected. Well, he really didn't know what to expect, but this wasn't it. The room was looked like a throne room made of marble. Naruto noticed a pillar in the center of the room. Embedded in the center of the pillar was none other than the Heaven's Blade. Naruto looked to Riho's side and back at the pillar. What's the sword doing there? It's the final test, Naruto. Your next trial is to remove that sword from the pillar. If you let go of the sword at any time, you will automatically fail. It may look easy, but this is the last trial for a reason, Naruto. Getting his attention. Riho pointed to the stairs on the left side of the room that led up to the balcony. The balcony was about five stories high, and it ended on the opposite side with the beginning of the stairs on the right side. I will be on that balcony watching you. I will not be leaving this room until you complete this test. You can begin whenever you like. Naruto nodded, and then he slowly walked to the pillar. Ryuho walked up to the stairs to watch Naruto from high above. Naruto walked up to the steps that led to the pillar. He studied the sword in front of him. I guess it's now or never. Naruto reached out for the sword slowly. All of his hands were wrapped around the sword. Naruto started to feel weird. Suddenly, he was covered by a greenish light. Riho smirked. So it begins. Naruto looked around to see that he was in a completely different room. The room was completely white. Didn't he just grab the sword? Must be some kind of an illusion. An illusion, you say? Naruto looked all over, trying to find the voice. Who are you and where the hell am I? Naruto asked as he kept searching for the voice. 
So much anger and hate. I can see it in you, Naruto, the boy said. What the hell are you talking about? Are you going to be a coward and stay hidden, or are you going to show yourself? Naruto was getting annoyed. Do you really want to see me, Naruto? Do you really want to see the one who knows all of your desires, your ambitions, your likes, and your dislikes? Do you really want to see me? Well, do you? The voice echoed throughout the room. Naruto smirked. Enough with the dramatics, and just show yourself already. If you really want to see me, Naruto, why don't you just- Naruto is getting beyond annoyed. If I want to see you, why don't I just what? Why don't you just look in a mirror? Naruto's eyes widened. The voice came directly from behind him. Naruto slowly turned around, only to be shocked to see who stood before him. It was himself. He was wearing everything Naruto had on. However, his shirt, sandals, and sweat were black, while his jacket was red. Who are you? Naruto asked. I'm you, Naruto, the part that you hide. I've always been a part of you. We are one, and nothing will change that. You can't deny what you keep bottled in your heart, Naruto, the Naruto clone said. Naruto charged the Naruto clone out of anger. Stop saying that you are me, bastard. Naruto went to punch, but only hit air. The clone appeared behind Naruto. He leaned forward and whispered into Naruto's ear. Hate and anger is what drives you. The hate in your heart for the leaf. The anger towards Kakashi favoring Sasuke over you. Your hate for Sakura and your anger at Tsunade and the council for banishing you. That's why you are as strong as you are now. Your recent anger and what your father did and your hatred for him will drive you to be strong if you just accept me. Naruto went to swing again. But his doppelganger disappeared into thin air. Naruto screamed at the sky. Get back here, you fucking coward! The voice echoed throughout the room. Hey, Naruto, do you remember the day that you first entered the orphanage? Naruto looked around to see the scene change. He was now in the orphanage. He looked at his younger self, who was four years old at the time. He remembered this day perfectly. He was upbeat about going to the orphanage. He remembered that his previous caretaker treated him like crap. He was hoping that it would all change here. He was wrong. After a couple Junins who really didn't like him as far as he knew, dropped him off in the presence of the head of the orphanage. She immediately began mistreating him. Naruto watched as the lady with brown hair who looked to be in her thirties snatched the hand of his younger self. Come with me, child. I will show you to your room. But monsters like you deserve to be on the street. The younger Naruto put his head down. The present Naruto knew what the boy was thinking. Why did everyone call him a monster? Why did he do that when I was so wrong? Naruto waited, knowing what was going to come out of his four-year-old's mouth. Yes, please, everyone calls me a monster. I don't remember doing anything that would hurt people. Please tell me what I did and I will apologize. I just want to be forgiven for whatever I did. The kid was waiting for her to help him. If she told him what he did, then he could make it up to the people, right? Wrong again. The lady was so enraged that the boy would ask for forgiveness for what he did. She slapped him hard, causing him to fall to the ground. Naruto was holding his cheek. The lady looked upon him with cold eyes. You will never be forgiven for what you've done, you monster. Okage should have ended your life. Then we would all be happy. Present Naruto opened his closed eyes in memory. It was one of the most painful experiences in his life. His doppelganger appeared on the side of him. It hurts, doesn't it? It makes you angry, because all you ever wanted was to be normal, and they rejected you. Your own home, crying out loud, it made you. Naruto opened his eyes and completed the sentence. Angry. His clone walked around him while speaking. Yes, it made you angry, and for the first time in your life, you hated someone. She was the first person that you truly hated. You even tried to be nice and friendly, and it didn't work, did it? Naruto had a sad look on his face. No, it didn't. Those three years in the orphanage were hell for me. I hated everyone there because they treated me like I was nothing. It didn't even change when you entered the academy, now did it? His laugh echoed throughout the room as he faded out of sight. The scenery before Naruto had changed again. This time, Naruto was seven. It was his first day at the academy. He'd been living on his own for the past three weeks, and he couldn't have been happier. The old man stopped by four times a week to check up on Naruto, and to make sure that he was okay. Naruto was happy, because today he would start his quest to become a ninja. 
Naruto arrived at the academy in time for the Hokage speech. Most of the parents were looking at him and whispering, but he didn't care. Today, he would start his path to becoming a great ninja. After the speech, the students had to go to the class that they were assigned to. The students knew of their class because they were sent letters informing them of their class schedule. Naruto went to the class that his letter said. The teacher, a chunin with red hair, gave Naruto a look of hate. Those were the same eyes that everyone looked upon him with. Not here too. It was lunchtime, and all of the students were in the yard, playing or practicing shuriken techniques. Naruto decided to go make friends. He walked up to a group of girls and guys. As he approached them, he waved. Hello, my name is Naruto Uzumaki. What's yours? Ino Yamanaka, the girl smiled at the boy. Naruto noticed that everyone else next to Ino was whispering about something. One of the girls whispered into Ino's ear. After the girl finished whispering into her ear, Ino looked at him. Sorry, Naruto, but our parents told us that we can't play with you because you're nothing but a troublemaking monster. Ino looked at the kids in a group. Come on, everybody, let's play ninja. All the kids cheered and ran away, leaving Naruto alone. He walked up to the empty swing on the other side of the park and sat on it. He watched how the other kids played. He sat there and cried. The voice echoed throughout the room again. Even your peers hated you. Naruto couldn't say anything. Seeing these past memories that he thought he had gone over were reopened. Wounds that he thought he had healed. You can't deny that you felt hate and anger, Naruto. Why do you repress me? Is it because you fear the side of you that I represent? Fear. If you release me, then you would be a monster? Well, you don't have to worry about that, because you are. Naruto clenched his fist. He was getting angry, but at the same time, his double was right. Ryuho was looking down at Naruto holding the sword. The look in his face showed Ryuho that he was going through a lot of pain. Ryuho noticed that the balcony was becoming filled with members of his clan. Some of the female members as well as the male members had come to see if Naruto was the next successor. He was so focused on Naruto that he didn't even see his wife and his daughter come up next to him. His wife was witnessing the test for the second time. She was there when Shinji took the test and failed. She hoped that Naruto didn't share the same fate. She talked low enough so only her husband could hear. Do you think he's okay? I don't know, he's been through a lot, so it's safe to say that this trial is by far the hardest for him. He's facing all the negativity in his heart, which includes all the anger, hatred, and jealousy that is built up in it. When I faced this trial, I was confronted with the anger and hate towards the man that killed Shinji's father. Compare that to the hatred for the villagers and the anger of his friend betraying him, and it's safe to say that I had it easy. Naruto must confront those feelings in his heart and face them. Riho gave his wife his honest opinion. You said that it took you three days to complete this task. How long do you think it'll take Naruto considering what he's been through? Kiori waited for him to answer. Who knows? I suspect that it'll be longer than it took me. That much is certain. Let's just pray that he can do it, Riho stated. He will. They both looked down at their daughter. Riho asked. How do you know? Big Brother Naruto said that he would be okay and that he would pass his test. I believe in him, Yami said without ever taking her eyes off Naruto. Kiori and Riho looked at each other and smiled. They hoped she was right. Midnight in Konoha. Yumi suddenly jumped out of her sleep. She was now sitting up in her bed, breathing hard. She placed her hands over her heart. Naruto is in pain. Tears started to fall from her eyes. Naruto, what is happening to you?